host, Dr. Mark Hyman, and welcome to The Doctor's Pharmacy, a place for conversations that matter. And today our guest is Dr. Terry Walls, who's an extraordinary physician who cured herself of multiple sclerosis, which doesn't seem like a sentence you can even say, but here she is to prove it. And I can share with you that she's an extraordinary woman who's, who's really pioneered a new way of thinking about how we treat chronic disease. She's a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa. She's the author of The Walls Protocol, How I Beat Progressive MS Using Paleo Principles and Functional Medicine. And of course, the cookbook that goes along with it, The Walls Protocol Cooking for Life, the revolutionary modern paleo plan to treat all chronic autoimmune conditions. That's a big promise. We're going to get into that. Uh, you can learn more about her work at terrywalls.com. She hosts the Walls Protocol Seminar every August where anyone can learn how to implement the protocol with ease and success. You can follow her on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and learn more about her MS trials by reaching out to her team at msdietstudy at healthcare.uiowa.edu. And this is an important thing because we have to research these things. Now, she's basically had a story that uh, has sort of rocked the world of multiple sclerosis, which is she was this active human who basically became debilitated from MS and was barely functioning in a wheelchair. And tell us, Terry, how you kind of found your way to health through this approach that you call the Walls Protocol. Well, I, uh, thank you, Mark. It's such an honor to be here with you, and I'm so glad to count you as a, a very good friend. Hmm. So, you know, I'm a academic internal medicine doc. I was very skeptical about diet and lifestyle and supplements and complementary alternative medicine. I couldn't understand why people wasted billions and billions of dollars. You know, I think uh, all those stupid that supplements just give you expensive urine, right? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and I was very skeptical. Uh, you know, but God has a mysterious way about him or her. Uh, and so, you know, in 2000, I was diagnosed with MS. Uh, and 18 I, years ago. 18 years ago. But, you know, in retrospect, my symptoms began during medical school in uh, 1980 with episodes of electrical uh, face pain, um, which I stoically put up with. Uh, I could figure out that they were worse with stress um, and uh, gradually more frequent, more severe. Uh, in 2000, I had... Uh, a weakness in my left leg, got a big workup, including MRIs of my brain, spinal cord, spinal tap. And uh, they said, well, uh, this is relapsing remitting MS. Uh, and being like... Which all is a could, very bad diagnosis. A, a, bad, a bad diagnosis. And I looked at the literature and uh, saw that within 10 years, uh, half have difficulty walking, needing a cane, walk or a wheelchair. Uh, and half won't be able to work due to severe uh, fatigue. So I wanted to treat my disease aggressively. I sought out the best center doing research here in the Midwest. That was the Cleveland Clinic. Saw the best people, took the newest drugs, and within three years, I needed a tilt recline wheelchair. Oh, that's uh, good progress. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely it was not going the right direction. And that's when I started uh, uh, researching. I started uh, reading PubMed. Uh, I would uh, begin experimenting myself. I adopted the paleo diet uh, on, basically on the recommendation of my Cleveland Clinic physicians. Really? Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Uh, I continued to go downhill. Uh, I took Tizabri, continued to go downhill. Uh, I switched to Celsept. I continued to go downhill. Um, and these are powerful immune suppressing. Very drugs. powerful. Yeah. Um, but I was happy to take them because um, I knew I was headed towards becoming bedridden. Uh, possibly demented. Uh, I was having more and more trouble with severe pain that was very difficult to control. Um, so I was thrilled to take these drugs and attempt to stave all of that off. Um, I, uh, as I read PubMed, I started uh, uh, experimenting with uh, supplements and would eventually figure out that supplements targeting my mitochondria helped my fatigue uh, somewhat. Um, although, I, and I was slowing the speed of my decline. So I'm, 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 I'm thrilled, I'm grateful, uh, and I'm really excited about reading PubMed. Grateful uh, from a wheelchair. <laughs> very grateful from a wheelchair. Very, very grateful. Um, and then, you know, by the summer of 07... You're a glass half full person, clearly. <laughs> clearly, clearly. You know, and, and this, by the summer of 07, I was so weak I could not sit up in a regular chair. I had mm. a zero-gravity chair, I'm fully reclined, mm. um, or I'm in bed. I'm struggling to walk 10 feet using two walking sticks. Uh, my uh, boss calls me, in, calls me in and tells me he's assigned me to the traumatic brain injury clinic 
uh, in six months, I'll be seeing patients without residence. And I know that, uh, of course, that means uh, what he's really saying is, Terry, we are done redesigning your job for you, and I'll be forced to take medical disability finally at that time. Yeah. Uh, so th- uh, that's a, a difficult summer. But, you know, two months later, I discover uh, on one of my Google searches um, the Institute for Functional Medicine. Yeah. And I took the course on neuroprotection in the midst of my brain fog. So this was, uh, uh, it was a, a bit challenging, but I got through it. I had a longer list of supplements, a little deeper understanding of the things I could be doing uh, for my mitochondria uh, and for my brain. Uh, and I added that. Uh, and then I had another really, really big aha moment, like, yeah, I should... I should take this list of supplements and redesign my paleo diet to maximize the nutritional intake. So yeah. I redesign my diet. You're going to be eating paleo cookies all day, and that's yeah. not exactly And that's not, <laughs> not the right thing. So uh, I, I restructured my diet, uh, and uh, within a month, my fatigue was markedly reduced. My uh, mental clarity was clearly improving. In three months, I uh, get up and I'm walking with a cane. Uh, and you got out of your wheelchair. I'm out of my wheelchair, walking around with a cane. Uh, and in uh, uh, nine months, I'm on my bike and I pedal around the block for the first time in uh, six years. Uh, and in 12 months, I do a 20-mile bike ride with my family. Unbelievable. So, so it was a year. A year. Now, take us a little bit slower through what you did because you... Ate I did a lot. The paleo diet, then you did the drugs, but then you went to this neuroprotection plan uh, it, module it's, from IFM and you learn from there right. what you could do to optimize your system. So optimize my system. I also add in there, I added in electrical stimulation of my muscles. That was a, a technique that athletes have been doing for decades to speed the recovery from athletic injuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my physical therapist uh, had agreed to let me add that. So mm. I, I was doing that. I had gone back to adding meditation at night. Um, uh, so I added that back, uh, and then, you know, I, I had this very intensive nutrition, uh, so I had ramped up my vegetables, uh, to like, uh, nine cups of vegetables a day, mm. uh, a which small, is 18 servings, 18 servings, not the five to nine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 18 servings. Uh, and so a small amount of meat, lots and lots of vegetables, and very specific groups of vegetables. Very specific right? Which groups. Had very specific medicinal effects very, that you talked about. Exactly. It, it's all designed very intentionally around my mitochondria, around detox, around myelin production, uh, around brain structures, neurotransmitters, uh, you know, based on, on, on science in a yeah. very methodical way. Uh, and I did all this, Mark, not to get better because. I had completely accepted what my neurologist, primary care docs, had told me it's for a years. It's a one-way street. Functions once lost with progressive MS are permanently gone. So I was doing all this so I could have the limited function that I had a and little bit longer worse. and not get worse. I, you know, and I uh, so I was thrilled to do all of that to not get worse. But and then the other thing that's really interesting, Mark, is as I was getting remarkably better. But as, as part of having a progressive neurodegenerative disease is you get to a point where you take every day as it comes, one day at a time, no expectations about what it means. Mm-hmm. So I'm remarkably better. I'm thinking more clearly. I, I, my pain is gone, which is a, a huge deal for me. And pain I, I, is a big symptom in MS. A pain is a huge symptom. It was a, a, a huge problem for me as well. So my pain is gone. I'm walking. I'm thinking. I'm biking. Uh, it actually, it wasn't until I, I biked that I realized, like, you know, I think I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, until then, I was just taking it one day at a time. Yeah. Amazing. It, you know, the day, the day that I, I biked, um, it was on Mother's Day, um, you know, yeah. and uh, I'm crying, my wife's crying, my kids are crying, uh, and that's when I understood that who knew what the future would hold? Yeah. That clearly neurology has it wrong. Yeah. Clearly neurology has it wrong. And who knew how much uh, recovery might be possible? It's a very hopeful story. And I think um, I'd love to know what exactly you're eating. People are probably listening. Well, what are the what are the 19 or 18 servings of vegetables you ate? And what groups yes. were they? And what do they do? Okay. So um, 
first, and I think the most powerful one is all these greens. So uh, I was having tons and tons of green leafy vegetables. Uh, so I was probably having six to, uh, actually six to nine cups measured so like raw. Collards, kale. Collards, spinach, kale, right. uh, a little bit of spinach. Uh, I was very, I really craved kale in, in a huge way. But I'd have collards, uh, I would have uh, Swiss chard, um, I had uh, lots and lots of salads, I would have some cooked greens. Um, I was very big into uh, cabbage family vegetables. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Brassicas. cabbage, broccoli, uh, turnips, rutabagas, uh, lots of it raw, uh, some cooked, uh, but it's also very, very big uh, into raw. Uh, garlics, lots of garlic, uh, shallots, uh, onions. Because they uh, have sulfur, they boost sulfur, the uh, uh, Boost the detox, boost your ability to make gamma aminobutyric acid, intracellular uh, glutathione. Um, uh, and then uh, very much into uh, mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms uh, stimulate uh, and prime adaptive and innate immune cells. Uh, they also stimulate uh, your ability to make nerve growth factors. Um, so yeah, medicinal mushrooms are powerful. Very powerful. They have all kinds of amazing ingredients that aren't and, in other foods. And and garlic and mushrooms are uh, medicinal foods across many many cultures across mm-hmm. all the continents. Mm. So th- these are medicinal foods um, with a lot of ancient cultural wisdom. So for greens, brassicas, and garlic col- and onions, and, and then mushrooms. That, good, uh, color. And then color. So the polyphenols are a, a marker for color. And the uh, polyphenols, again, and, and, and study after study, the more color you have, the lower the rates of heart disease, Diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, so cancers. So you want color. And furthermore, blue, purple, black, uh, a lot of studies showing you can have measurable improvement in cognition in as little as 16 weeks uh, using just a cup of blueberries as in placebo uh, double blind crossover trials. That's hardly any time at all. No, that's amazing. Um, Not it, Skittles, though. Not Skittles. Those are, not color. Skittles. Those are colorful. <laughs> Those are the wrong kind of color, my friend. So, again, three cups of deeply pigmented stuff. Um, and then uh, fats. You know, fats uh, have, Fat. uh, have um, a, a critical role. All of our cells are wrapped in fat. They're uh, fat wrappers, the cell membranes. Uh, and our brain... Uh, is 60 to 70 percent fat. Mm-hmm. Um, so your nerve coverings, which get destroyed in MS, are also fat. Fat, and they need arachidonic acid. They need eicosapentaenoic acid. They need the cosaxenoic acid. They need omega six and omega three fats. Um, and so I needed to have more fat uh, in the diet. Did you use saturated fat? You know, actually, I did. So I I used lots of fat. So uh, would have flax oil, hemp oil. Uh, in the dressings uh, that I'd use. Um, and then uh, we would uh, cook uh, in saturated fat. I'd use coconut oil. I'd use uh, bacon fat, duck fat. Mm-hmm. Um, my uh, vets, because I, you know, for years I worked at the vet, uh, so I'd, I would teach the vets. Uh, my favorite recipe was uh, bacon and greens. You cook up some bacon, take the bacon out, leave the bacon fat. Dump in yeah. the greens, stir them around till they're wilted, add the bacon back. If you didn't like it, just double the bacon the next time you make it. <laughs> and my vets would go like, oh my God, I, you mean I can eat bacon? Yeah. That actually tastes, you know, sounds like right. it would taste wonderful. So yeah. um, it would have lots of uh, avocados as well, mm-hmm. uh, get into uh, nuts and seeds. Um, uh, and so w- what is remarkable was the speed at which I could see the difference. Uh, in 30 days. So, I, so it was well, in. Think about it. You know, you, you took all these drugs, they didn't work. But when you use food as a drug, as medicine, it actually worked faster and very better. fast. <laughs> it, and that's exactly what I uh, saw in clinic. I was able to teach uh, my residents in clinic as well that food is the most powerful medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it works uh, amazingly faster, better, fast. Cheaper than most drugs. And it's. Yes. Uh, it's it's an amazing substance. And when people understand it's not just calories, as we learn in functional medicine, it's information. And they can go, wait a minute, I can upgrade my biology by putting better information in. It's your body. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So besides the food, that's powerful, and the stimulation and the meditation, you also probably did other things. Were there diagnostic tests that you did on yourself that you discovered anything that was well, off or out of balance? You know, uh, so into my recovery, uh, so two years into my recovery, um, I, I thought, well, I'm sure toxic load was uh, a big issue in all of this. So keep in mind, I've been uh, walking around, hiking now, I've been biking, uh, uh, very little pain. So I'm in great shape. Uh, and I finally did a 24-hour uh, 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 heavy metals uh, mm-hmm. challenge test. And I was diffusely toxic in everything. Yeah. Everything. All your metals were high. Uh, all my metals were high. I think there were only four uh, that were not high. Mm. Um, I was even high in uh, uranium, uh, thorium, thallium. Thallium is, you know, kale is now in California. The ground is... Has thallium in it. So, so we we have so poisoned our our soils um, that uh, it, so with many of our fertilizers um, are, are uh, relatively uh, toxic. Uh, so yes, unfortunately, many of our foods are uh, toxic. And uh, now the other thing that I should tell you, I repeated all of that four years later, and everything is gone. Amazing. So who knows, like how incredibly toxic I was in the very Before, beginning. Before, right. In the very how beginning. Did, how did you get rid of them all? Um, well, when I designed my protocol, I designed mm. it around uh, boosting the detox enzyme. So mm-hmm. that's why I stress the greens, the sulfur, the color. Uh, I, I added in there some N-acetylcysteine uh, and some uh, algae as well. Uh, some and binders to get the metals out as and well. things to upregulate your glutathione. It, 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 and then uh, the other thing... Uh, six months into my recovery, I uh, was able to uh, overcome my heat uh, intolerance. Yeah. And so I, I got a sauna, and I've been sauning uh, regularly uh, ever since. Amazing. So it was basically food, food, supplements, electrical right. stimulation. And, and, and very basic supplements. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, B vitamins, uh, N acetylcysteine, and algae. That's it. That's it. No vitamin D? Well, Yes, there's vitamin D in there, of course. Because there's evidence around vitamin yeah, D. Yeah, and plenty of vitamin D. Yeah. Uh, and I, I also use sunlight. Sunlight. You know, yeah. uh, sunlight is more effective than vitamin D mm-hmm. orally. You so. put sunblock on your face, but the rest of your body will yeah. definitely be a good one because yeah. you don't want to yeah. age fast. But yeah, it's yeah. powerful. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So you've taken this insight that you had from your own healing. Yes. Uh, and you've done an extraordinary thing, which is you've created a model that you use to treat patients yes. and to train other physicians yes, and providers yes. and to do research in this space. And you were at the VA in Iowa and had done amazing work with people who had very little resources, ton, not a ton of money, couldn't do a ton of testing. Yeah. And you know, people think functional medicine is always all about testing, it's all about supplements, but you really were able to show that it really is primarily food and lifestyle, and just a few basic things Very make basic. a huge difference. So tell us about what you learned yeah, in you that know, process. So, so I had my personal transformation, uh, and then I start talking about food and exposures. Uh, and I change how I practice medicine in my traumatic brain injury clinic. I'm uh, really focused in on diet and lifestyle, uh, and I have to deal with uh, physician complaints because I'm not practicing like my colleagues. So I had to meet with my chief of staff, uh, go over what I was doing and why, bring down my papers, uh, and uh, get some coaching on how to document in the medical record so I could pass peer review and make sure everybody was, was comfortable with what you. I was doing. Happy So uh, we got that. God forbid you're telling people to eat better. <laughs> yeah. So so I, I got that down. Uh, and then because I was having such great results, the uh, chief of medicine uh, came in and told me he was pulling me out of primary care. And would I uh, open up a clinic where I could practice the way I wanted to practice? And uh, I said, no, I, I won't do that. Uh, uh, and here's why I'm refusing. Um, you need to get uh, endorsement by the chief of staff uh, and the director of the hospital because uh, we just want to be sure that they know what I'm going to do and that they approve They're behind this. it, yeah. Um, and so I thought that was probably going to be the end of it. Uh, two weeks later, he came back and he said, I have the endorsements. We're uh-huh, good. That's so great. <laughs> so uh, we got the endorsements going. Uh, and then uh, we decided that we'd call it the Therapeutic Lifestyle Clinic. Uh, so it was very clear to my referring physicians and to the patients that this was all about diet and lifestyle. 
uh, that I'm not prescribing drugs. And diet and lifestyle as treatment, not just as treatment prevention, like as therapeutic. Treatment. It lifestyle. was therapeutic, uh, and you could come. You had to be referred in uh, by a physician. Could be for a mental health problem, a uh, medical problem. So we saw people from all, all sorts of issues. I met with primary care and the subspecialty clinics and said, uh, give me your most ill people who are willing to use a therapeutic diet and lifestyle. I'm using no drugs. It's just going to be diet and lifestyle. Uh, we did this through a series of group classes. Uh, the first class was, here's my story. Here's the concepts of uh, the therapeutic lifestyle. We talked about functional medicine, integrative medicine, diet, lifestyle, detox, mitochondria, yeah. all of that stuff. Uh, and then I invited people to either uh, just go back to the doc and say, this is too hard, or I'll work gradually on my diet and then meet with the dietitians, or they, if they would commit to being gluten-free 100%, lots of vegetables for 100 days, they could come work with me. We'd have a group intake where I'd meet with them for two weeks as a group to sort of uh, do their timeline of their health experiences. And then they would meet with the dietitian for uh, two hours who would have a cooking class and help them reimagine breakfast and lunch mm-hmm. and reimagine the relationship with mm-hmm. food. Very practical. Uh, and then we would see them uh, once uh, a week for a skills class. As many people as could fit in the room could come get the skills classes. And we'd have a support group of 6 to 22 people at a time that we'd see uh, every other month. Uh, in the labs um, that I had, uh, a CBC, uh, vitamin D, homocysteine. Very basic. Uh, fasting lipids. That was it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the uh, kind of supplements, uh, B vitamins, uh, fish oil, vitamin D. Uh, and then I could tell people if they went on their own to go buy NAC and algae, uh, methyl B12, methylfolate. And that was it. Um, and now, and before I got the lifestyle clinic going, when I was just in my traumatic brain injury clinic, no labs. I only got to see people twice a year for 20 minutes. Wow. And even in that clinic, we had stunning success. Amazing. And, and, and so that's why... Now, you've the, done research now on this. So you yes, had it, yeah. how um, has the research gone and what have you learned? And can you share some of the most exciting oh, things sure. that you've discovered in your research? Because this isn't just an idea or something that's on the fringe. You've actually been in a major academic center doing yes, the hard work, yeah, yeah, proving yeah. the model and seeing extraordinary changes. So the the very first thing is what we call a safety feasibility study. So, uh, and I have to is thank... Is it safe to eat 18 Is cups it safe of, to eat uh, all these vegetables? Seven, seven, 18 is servings it safe to do a stress-reducing activity? <laughs> is it safe to meditate? <laughs> you know, it, and um, my uh, chair of medicine, Paul Rothman, uh, uh, had me write a, a case report up what, uh, from my own Your personal story. story. Uh, and then he called me back in when that was published. Said, okay, now we're going to have you do a safety study. Uh, and I said, well, this is outside. This is the type of research field that I'm in. So, yes, I'll get you the mentors. So he helped me with the, uh, getting the mentors on board, uh, designed the study. Then I had to get the funding. Uh, so I uh, worked with a group, in, a philanthropist in Canada that gave me the funding to get the uh, safety study going. So we wrote up the protocol that copied everything that I did. Uh, the supplements, the uh, meditative program, the uh, exercise e mm-hmm. uh, and we codified uh, the diet. Uh, we we uh, got funding, uh, got it through, and then the clinical research unit uh, refused to give me permission because the diet was not safe because it excluded food groups. Like grains and beans Gra- and dairy. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so it got uh, declined. So I was required to do a pre-study uh, uh, on myself to show that it was nutritionally sound. Mm-hmm. So we did that. The dietitian who uh, analyzed my diet, who's been doing dietary assessment uh, research for 35 years, said, this is the most nutrient-dense diet yeah. I've ever analyzed. Well, anybody you know, knows about the food groups, how that came about was as a way to sell more agricultural products, meat, dairy, grains, yes. you know, vegetables. Those, those were food groups that had nothing to do with science. It had to do with marketing and and there is no biological requirement for grains or even dairy. Yes. And, and so once we finally got permission, we uh, then I was required to have a safety report uh, that I would fill out um, back to this uh, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, after we did the first 10 subjects. Uh, uh, and that worked out really... I also know I had money to do 20. But, you know, that worked out very well because we had great success with the first 10. So I went back to my Canadian 
philanthropist. Oh. And I said, you know, we had such great success. How would you feel about getting MRIs on the next 10? And uh, he said, yes. So uh, we have those MRIs. Uh, as a matter of fact, we uh, showed those results on those MRIs uh, earlier uh, uh, this week here. I was able to show that brain volume is protected uh, by following uh, uh, the Walls Protocol. Hmm. Uh, Was the myelination improved? Well, like um, in the brain of MRI so, so we're patients able with MS, you see the white lesions, white matter lesions, right? And they we analyze total brain volume, and for disability, brain volume is much more strongly associated with disability than uh, whether uh, the white matter lesions hmm. uh, or acute lesions. And we're, so we we're mostly uh, very, very curious about was what happens with brain volume. You hmm. know, and originally I, I was really disappointed because we still had brain volume loss uh, overall f- for the group, but brain volume loss in amp- progressive MS occurs uh, much more rapidly, two to three times as rapidly in progressive MS than it does in healthy aging. We're able to show that our brain volume loss was less than yeah. even healthy aging. Right. So we're, we're protecting our brain to ex- uh, extraordinary levels uh, in that first study. Uh, and so we'll be you know, submitting that for uh, publication in a journal. We're, so we're very excited uh, for that. Um, we had remarkable uh, uh, reduction in fatigue, remarkable improvement in quality of life. Um, in the neurological symptoms? In the neurological symptoms. We're also able to show that uh, in half of our folks, we had remarkable improvement in gait, uh, w- which is remarkable with progressive MS. Yeah. Because none of them should have improved. Right. Uh, and the fact that we had clinically meaningful improvement in gait in half uh, was really quite remarkable. Uh, then the next study that we did was a uh, randomized study, which is a weightless control. So people, uh, we did just the diet in relapsing remitting MS folks. Uh, they came in, uh, we did assessments, we randomized them to either get trained on the diet or to wait for 12 weeks and then get trained on the diet. Uh, and again, we were able to show that uh, fatigue went down, quality of life improved, uh, and uh, motor function, again, uh, improved. Uh, and uh, now we have a study funded by the uh, National Multiple Sclerosis Society that comparing the low saturated fat diet uh, and the Walsh diet. Because uh, the Swank diet was a low fat diet. Very low fat That was diet. recommended for MS patients. Uh, only by uh, Dr. Swank, the uh, conventional neurologist, uh, uh, for a long time have, conv- have uh, steadfastly held there's no scientific prospective study that has shown um, uh, diet has anything to do with MS. Now, fortunately, as they're being to understand the role of diet has on epigenetics, on the microbiome, yeah. that uh, conventional neurology is catching up to us and saying diet does matter. Yeah, yeah. They it's are amazing. catching up. It's amazing that food is the single biggest information input we have to our bodies every day yes. that controls every function of our biology, and yet how could it not be connected to our well, health, right? You know, it, it is so uh, challenging to do good dietary studies uh, because if you do a, a food-based intervention study, supplement studies are easy. That's like you know a drug, a drug study. But if you do food, now if I'm going to do it well, I have to convince you, Mark, to give up foods that you love, straight eating foods that you don't like, you don't know how to make, uh, get get your family to do it with you so you can sustain it. Uh and there's a real art to train you to be willing to do that. Uh, and then another art to measuring what you actually did. Mm-hmm. This is complex uh, research to do. It's expensive to do. Yeah. Uh, far more expensive than drug studies. Uh, so that's one of the reasons with this so little uh, research. Yeah, that's true. So you also are exploring not just MS, but other brain yes. issues. Yeah. So yeah. talk about the kind of things besides MS that you're working on and what kind of results you're seeing. So so in my uh, lifestyle clinics, um, again, we were able to keep track of who's coming to see us. Uh, pain was the number one reason that people would come in. Uh, then autoimmunity, um, metabolic problems like uh, mm-hmm. diabetes, heart disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in terms of the types of neurologic problems that people would come in, uh, Parkinson's, uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, of course, uh, 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 traumatic brain injury, mm-hmm. PTSD, mood disorders. 
pretty uh, much everything for which we have very poor treatment. Poor mess. treatments, poor treatments. And uh, certainly what we would consistently would see, uh, some of the first things people would notice is fatigue going down, energy going up, uh, mental clarity improving, brain fog diminishing, mm-hmm. irritability diminishing. Quality of life. So quality improving. of life, absolutely uh, improving. Now, because the VA has an electronic medical record, I was also able to get my quality improvement people uh, uh, do some uh, analyses for us. We are able to show that the hemoglobin A1C was coming down, the body mass index coming down, blood pressure coming down. At the same time that the number of medications... Was that coming down. ...was coming down as well. And the pain medications coming, coming down, down. And the narcotic use coming down. So, you know, incredibly exciting stuff. Mm. Very, very gratifying. And then, you know, in, in the thousands of followers that I have, you know, routinely I'm being contacted uh, by people who are telling me that their treating physicians had given up on them, saying mm-hmm. there was nothing that they had to offer them for a condition, which I, of course, have never heard of. And they're telling me that they've uh, implemented the WALS protocol and that their functions are improving. And so then yeah. I'm Googling, like, so what, what are these conditions? <laughs> and you know, some of them are autoimmune, some of them are neurodegenerative. Uh, and uh, it, very consistently, it's, it's a similar pattern that I see. Energy is improving, mental clarity is improving, pain is diminishing. Uh, well, the protocol is anti-inflammatory, it's detoxifying, it's mitochondrial boosting, it's gut repairing. Absolutely. And these are all the foundations of creating health. And so when you do that, regardless of what condition you have, people seem to get better. You know, and I'm trying to teach people that what I, we need to be focusing on is the creation of health, that this is your best treatment for whatever chronic disease you have. Yeah, you don't and do it about treating the disease, you treat... You create health. Health, right. You create health. And the health. disease goes away as a side effect, I often say. It will often uh, diminish. And, mm. and depending on the person that, yes, you may still die from your cancer. You'll have a higher quality of life. You may still die from your Huntington's, but you'll have higher quality of life. And what you may discover is that your previously untreatable problem that your physicians say, I don't have anything to offer you, may find, you may discover that it can be stabilized. The steepness of the decline can be slowed. Or to everyone's amazement, you may discover that you, in fact, are slowly but steadily improving. Like you. Like me. So how many stories do you hear like your story where someone really was in a wheelchair and they get up and they're good and they're riding their bike 20 miles? You know, uh, just today I've, I've had several physicians tell me that they've had uh, uh, a gentleman from Hungary said that he had people coming to him in, in the wheelchair who's out running marathons. Unbelievable. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that yet, but I, I'm hoping. That's <laughs> so amazing. <sighs> it's so powerful. And, and, you know, multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. Yes. So you're focused on the neurologic stuff and the pain stuff, but how does this apply across autoimmune disease? And what are the oh, so, ways in which that it can be so, used to help with that? You know, certainly this has been very, very helpful for Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And we've had people with rheumatoid arthritis uh, who were uh, severely disabled uh, have uh, resolution of their pain uh, and marked improvement in function. Uh, I've had people with psoriatic arthritis, uh, again, marked improvements in function. Uh, people with psoriasis, uh, marked uh, resolution of their skin problems. So uh, certainly this is a great approach for somebody with autoimmunity. Uh, and people with diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, mm-hmm. uh, heart failure. I've had folks with uh, heart failure who are told that they're going to be needing a heart transplant. Transplant, yeah. And like, and what happened? Well, yeah, you know, their ejection fraction keeps improving. That's the how much blood their heart can pump, which yeah. goes down yeah. with heart failure. Yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, yeah I keep telling them, you know, you got to be eating liver a couple times a week, heart once a week, and I mean, it sounds too good to be true, but the truth is that when you look at the principle of creating health, there are certain foundational concepts here: the right food, exercise, stress reduction, sleep, the right nutrients, and it doesn't matter what disease you have because when you provide the body what it needs, it often can recover. So it's not like there's one treatment for MS, another diet for cancer, another diet for Alzheimer's, another diet for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis. Like it's the same principles that you can apply to all these things. You know, when I was first uh, changed how I was practicing medicine, my uh, colleagues, my chief of staff was calling me up and saying, you know, Terry, and your colleagues are saying you're using the same treatment for everyone. 
You, you just can't do that. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I said to John, I said, well, I think we all have mitochondria. I think we all have liver, kidneys, brains. We all have cells. We, all, we, we need to provide the building blocks. And so I, I'm just trying to create health. Yeah. And we'll see what happens. Yeah. And you don't, you just follow those principles of functional medicine and it, it just, you're like, okay, I've never seen this disease before. And yet. We'll just see what happens. Yeah. It's powerful. And I, I think that, um, you know, I want to sort of get in a little bit into the diet again, because you said you came into this through the paleo yeah. track and then you sort of modified it to add a ton more veggies, yeah. which I sort of jokingly call the pegan diet, which is, you know, basically very low glycemic. But one of the principles, if people aren't aware of what a paleo diet is, is it removes yeah. grains, beans, and dairy. So why would you remove those foods? See, yeah. So, and I want to clarify for your audience, the paleo diet did not fix me. Supplements did not fix me. Mm -hmm. So I'd been a vegetarian 20 years, lots of grains, beans, legumes. Um, and it was a lot of prayer and meditation when I went back to eating meat. Uh, and I had lots of meat. I was still having eggs, I had some vegetables. Um, and I continued to go downhill. I added the vitamins and supplements. Continued to go downhill, albeit more slowly. Mm -hmm. And my energy was uh, better when I took my supplements. Very, very grateful. Um, and then when I uh, had my longer list of supplements, uh, thank you, Catherine Wilner and Jay Lombard. I uh, appreciate all you've done for me. Those are neurologists that focused on, uh, functional, on, medicine on functional medicine and repairing the brain. Yeah. Then when I said, okay, where is all this in the food? And I redesigned my paleo diet. This was all about ramping up uh, these vegetables. So now my amount of meat is, is really pretty modest. Uh, I have uh, two palm sizes uh, of meat uh, to one to two per day. So that's six to 12 ounces of meat uh, per day. Uh, and then you know, nine cups to 15 cups of vegetables uh, per day. Uh, now, we weren't talking about the microbiome back there in 2007, but what I was doing was really ramping up my microbiome uh, yeah. as well. I was ramping up my ability to detoxify, uh, and I was ramping up the enzymes involved in, uh, and, and uh, protecting uh, my mitochondria and, and the making um, uh, the... Uh, detox pathways uh, more effective, intracellular glutathione more effective. Uh, and so it was pr providing that structure. You went to the pharmacy. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y. That's why Absolutely. I call this the doctor's pharmacy because it's really about how to use food as medicine. And that's what you yeah. did. You know, and so the, the reason to remove the uh, beans, uh, grains, legumes has to do with something called lectins. Mm. And again, this depends on your genetic predisposition. And I think I, I probably am one of those people who are vulnerable to lectins, uh, that I probably have a, a severe inflammatory response. If I have gluten or dairy or eggs, my uh, face pain triggers uh, and I have horrific incapacitating levels of pain in six to 24 hours. Um, well, I don't get you off the gluten. <laughs> that'll, that'll get me off the gluten. Now, I, I, I can have uh, hummus on occasion. So, uh, so occasional use of, of hummus is fine. Uh, eggs would get me into big trouble. Uh, but is it the lectins? I mean, are there other inflammatory things in those foods? Because oh, you know, so, like when you cook, for example, beans and grains properly, you can reduce. You can reduce them. the lectins. Uh, you can uh, soak them, sprout them overnight. You can reduce them. And so, uh, in my book, I did create a protocol for vegetarian and vegans because I, I do think it's really important uh, to recognize that you have people who are spiritually very committed to being mm -hmm. uh, vegetarian, vegan. And so I wanted to be sure that I could help them do that in a way that's very optimal. It's, and in my clinics, even at the VA, we have vegetarian and vegans that yeah. I would help. I mean, there are some people who do thrive on that diet and other people don't. And Correct. I think you really have to pay attention to your body instead of a dogma or a belief. Yes. And you I know, think your body's going to tell you what it works and what doesn't. And there are people who do not do well, uh, do not do as well uh, eating the uh, uh, paleo diet. No, Because mm -hmm. uh, people uh, say meat is inflammatory. That Well, I, I think a diet that is... Many of my paleo friends, whom I love dearly, eat meat and very few vegetables, mm -hmm. and I think they're going to get, that's a problem. Yeah. I, I think that can be inflammatory, uh, and um, I would much rather have moderate the meat uh, and do some intermittent fasting and have more vegetables with them. I love the 9 to 15 
cups of cups. vegetables a that's day. Serving that's serving cups. That's right, 18 to 30 servings of vegetables. And I think it seems overwhelming, but it's not that hard. One, because uh, one, there's no almost no calories in them. Yes. Two, they're delicious and you can eat a lot and get full. I mean, I literally will binge on veggies. I'll make three or four side dishes of veggies to, you know, the, the, the protein's a side dish, right? Yeah. You know, and at the, at the VA, I tell people, I don't want you to be hungry. So, you know, it's two palm servings of meat and then as many vegetables uh, as you're hungry for. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's fine to have fat, to have uh, plenty of uh, olive oil, uh, flax, flax oil, walnut oil, hemp oil. Um, but there's no need to be hungry. If you're still hungry, eat more vegetables. Mm. And do and you find that the patients who are vegan or vegetarian do as well in terms of the recovery from autoimmune or... MS? Uh, potentially, yes. There are uh, some folks who uh, really need to figure out how to address uh, the B12 issues uh, and may have some issues with lectins. So sometimes it can be more challenging, but th- the vast majority of folks, uh, either the vegans and vegetarians, I can work with and do very well. Hmm. So what have you learned through this journey of your own health and then treating these patients, building these programs, writing the Walls Protocol, hearing feedback? What is sort of the surprising things that you've learned that work or maybe that don't work, things you've had to change or rethink? What, what have you learned? Over time, I've come to appreciate more and more the importance of personal resilience, uh, of understanding uh, what it is that you want your health for, uh, what is your personal mission, why is it you're doing this. Meaning uh, and purpose. Meaning and purpose and connection. Because I have to connect to all of that to have you to be willing to do the hard work that it takes to sustain the diet and lifestyle changes. I've also come to appreciate that this is a family intervention, not an Mm -hmm. individual intervention. Mm -hmm. The families who do this together are very successful. The person who does it alone with their family, not supportive, not eating and doing the diet and lifestyle with them will struggle. It's all about community, right? It is about community and family. So powerful. And that's how your groups are so successful because people do it together. So um, one last question. If you were queen for a day, and you could change anything in healthcare, food, medicine, what would it be to make the world a better place? Oh, absolutely. I would uh, reach out to our children. I want our children to learn how to cook. I want uh, all of our schools to uh, grow gardens. I want to have home ec and to teach kids to cook beginning uh, in first grade. Uh, I want to teach to have our churches Teaching have Teaching kitchens gardens. in every school. <laughs> Kitchen in every school and in every church, in every synagogue, every mosque, uh, every temple. We mm. need our families to be cooking uh, and eating together as a family and eating uh, lots and lots of vegetables. Mm. I love that. That is a great vision. I, I think we need to understand that cooking is a revolutionary act, that it will help us take back our food from the food system the convenience is killing us <laughs> and that we need to reinvent how we think about food because one, it's pleasurable, it's fun, it's delicious and it's easy and it's cheap to cook your own food if you know what you're doing. By teaching people how to cook, we made it affordable for people with food stamps. If we're going to create an epidemic of health, we have to teach our young people and all of our current families to cook again. Mm. And that you can adopt the Walls Protocol on food stamps, but you'll have to learn how to cook. Absolutely. That was what I saw with this family in South Carolina where I went down as part of the movie Fed Up and they lived in a trailer on food stamps and disability, a family of five, morbidly obese, diabetic, renal failure, on dialysis, hypertension, prediabetes, almost diabetes in this 15-year-old kid. And they didn't know how to cook. They had Anything. two generations of that family that didn't know how to cook. I showed them how to cook one meal, gave them a little guide on how to eat well for less, and they live in one of the worst food deserts in America, and they lost 200 pounds in the first year as a family. The son gained a bunch of it back because he went to work at Bojangles, and then he got himself together, and he lost 140 pounds, and he's now going to medical school. So it's uh, it's It a, can happen. It can happen. It can happen. So thank you so much for showing us that one person with determination and courage can go up against a system that doesn't support what they're doing and can actually make a real difference and change the world. And it's inspiring for all of us, not just your own recovery, but what you've shown can be done 
with a little bit of grit and determination. So thank you, Dr. Walls, for being on The Doctor's Pharmacy, a place for conversations that matter. If you've liked this podcast, please subscribe, leave a comment, a review. We'd love to hear from you. Makes a difference for us. And share this with your friends and family on Facebook and Twitter and social media. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy. Hallelujah. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.